Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello, this is Heidi. Everyone. This is Norman Lear. This is Ray. <laughs> Hell with this is this is these are the filmmakers, <laughs> Rachel and Heidi. Thanks for being here. Thank I said, "Here's my life. Do what you will with it." <laughs> and they, this gorgeous film. I had nothing to do with it creatively, but live it. Just, it took them took them a while to live it, and then we picked it up. Um, I guess this is a self-moderated situation. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, we, um, it came, it, was, it evolved naturally. We did start thinking about it early on after we read Norman's book, um, which is called Even This I Get to Experience. And so the book wasn't published yet when we, when we set out to make the film, but Norman shared the galleys of the book with us. And there was this recurring story, these recurring stories of when he was nine and 10 years old um, that were very prov profound in his life and um, things that he carried with him forever, like we all do. And so we, in the back of our head, we did have this concept of this, uh, uh, alter ego or this uh, avatar for Norman, but we didn't. We weren't really sure we were going to do it until definitely halfway through the production. Um, we really like layered films, and we had beautiful archive to work with and original. Stop interviews. that man! Uh -oh. Stop that man! <laughs> <laughs> and um, so. Oh, he's just moving seats uh, to get a picture. And uh, so, so basically, we, we wanted to opt for another layer that was sort of whimsicality and sort of in an almost fantasy uh, world. And so we decided to pursue it. We started working with um, uh, lighting designers in the theater and production designers. And we, we assembled a team last summer. And we came up with like six different incidents in his life. And we decided to try to uh, visualize them together with this team. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to take you it. You it. You do it. <laughs> yeah. I may have said this in the film, I don't remember. When uh, the night that uh, my father was taken away, it was the next night. My mother was selling the furniture. Move, we were moving out of Chelsea, Mass, where we were living, uh, because she couldn't stay there in the state of shame, she felt. And my mother and my sister finally disappeared. I, I, I don't remember seeing them much at all in the, couple of years, in the three years my dad was away. And I went to an uncle and uncle and then my grandparents. But uh, the night that she was, had decided to leave, she was selling the furniture and especially my father's red leather chair wi from which he and I used to listen to the Friday night fights from Madison Square Garden. And uh, I, I couldn't ever say how, what that chair meant to me with him gone. I could see him reaching for the Atwater Kent radio next to it. He controlled the dial just the way Archie did years later. Uh, on the television dial. And uh, in that condition, oh, one other thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to camp in a couple of weeks, and uh, my mother had not yet uh, sa uh, cut up the tape, the cotton tape that said Norman M. Lear, Norman M. Lear, Norman M. Lear, <laughs> to put in my, the clothes I was taking to camp. So, I was holding that in my hand when this asshole puts his hand on my shoulder and says to this nine-year-old in that situation, well, you're the man of the house now. A moment later, he was saying, men of the house don't cry. I had to understand, I think at that moment, uh, the foolishness of the human condition. How do you tell a kid in that situation? He's the man in the house now. And I, I got it. Somehow I got it. And I think having gotten it saved my life, just understanding how ridiculous the situation was. A grown man could say that. I think it's an interesting thing you bring up, though, uh, which is something we didn't really ever ask you, which is if you, you were in this condition with partly orphaned in some ways, why did you think that 
why did you feel empowered to have a voice the rest of your life? I mean, most people would shrink with insecurity from that kind of childhood and feel like they're worthless and they have nothing to say, but you did the opposite. Is it, it, that's an interesting, is it, is it because you sort of divorced yourself from? I, I don't know, I know that, uh, I remember, you know, in the course of these meetings and interviews and so forth, having to answer so many questions, I find myself thinking and remembering things I didn't remember when I was writing the book. Uh, and one of the things I remembered was uh, when I went to live with my uncle and uncle and, and, and was dealing with cousins, I remember I, I somehow, every Saturday matinee that I might have seen, movie that I might have seen, always comedies, uh, I remembered like, you know, like I had memorized. The, and I would imitate people from the film. And I would do that to ingratiate myself in the homes I was living in, and, you know, uh, as paying some kind of dues mm -hmm. that way. And uh, when, when I was living in Woodmont, Connecticut one summer uh, with uh, er all my family, because they couldn't afford but to be in my grandfather's house, who uh, my father's father had a little cottage, we, I don't know, 30 of us might have been in there at the same time. And uh, I remember there was a big, huge storm. And uh, everybody lost their, uh, their uh, clothespins <laughs> off their lines. Uh, and I filled up two. My uncle had a friend who made clothespins in New Haven. And, uh, and I took two pillowcases, went into New Haven, filled them with Close friends came back and sold them for, for a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> so I think pressed by the circumstance, I was I knew I had to fend for myself mm -hmm. and as I look back at it, that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Al along the you know, I love this, I uh, can't remember who said this, at the moment of commitment, the entire universe conspires to assure your success. I love the use of the word conspires in that context, at the moment of commitment. Now, a lot of times we think we're committed and we're not. But when we're committed, the phone rings when we didn't expect it, we read something, we trip over something, we wake up in the morning with a thought we didn't have when we went to bed, the universe conspires. So I was committed to, I wanted to be like my Uncle Jack who flicked me a quarter from time to time. That was the best role model I had. I wanted to be able to flick a quarter to a nephew. So, and, and I had uh, elderly relatives, my grandparents' uh, uh, generation, who would talk in awe in the Depression about somebody being a good provider. I a good provider. <laughs> 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 I can hear the sound. And uh, that's what I wanted to be, a good provider. I wanted to be my Uncle Jack. I could flip a quarter. So this is the long-winded answer to your question. When I came out to California, there was an Ed Simmons in my life. Our wives went to the movie. He came to California to be a comedy writer. We wrote something together that night. They came back from the movie. I said, it was I who said it, uh, let's see if we, let's go out and sell it. We had a lot of clubs in those years. Uh, and within four blocks of where we were living, where we were waiting for our wives to return and had written this parody. We went out and sold it for $25, $30. But that $15 that I got was half of what I made in a week selling door to door. And uh, so I, mazel. Anybody here understand the word mazel? <laughs> Basically, Norman had zero plan to do anything in Hollywood. <laughs> gap you're talking about. I know uh, your question uh, the, the answer to your question is that um, the Uncle Jack who flipped the quarter was a press agent so as you see in the film he goes to Emerson he drops out he goes to the war 
um, after the, at the end of the war when he was leaving, there, he, just, he tried to get a job as a press agent, and, and there's a great story in the book about how he, was, he made his own press release about this amazing, talented dude um, and to, to get work. Now, did you get work out of that? I did. Uh, but before I left Foggia, Italy, after tour duty, uh, I, had, uh, I, I had an offer for a, a, an audition for an appointment at a press agent, right. for a press agent, and I had a job. One guy said, I want that kid. One guy said, I want to meet that kid. I took the job I had in hand. Gotcha. And I was at it. But he, here's, I got to tell you how I got fired. <laughs> Do you remember that from I the book? I, I don't remember the firing story. Okay, so I was a press <laughs> agent for a year. Now, we, I wrote <coughs> amusing things that my clients ostensibly are, you know, were supposed to have said. Uh, there was a Leonard Lyons, there was a Walter Winchell, there was a Dorothy Kilgallen, there were a whole bunch of Anton Walker, a bunch of columnists, and the, there were seven newspapers in New York. And, God, isn't that a shame? There were seven newspapers. Uh, one of our clients was a show called Are You With It? And Are You With It was a review one of the acts in that review was Buster Shaver and his midgets. <laughs> the Buster Shaver's lead midget was named Olive. I wrote a, an item for uh, Dorothy Kilgallen, and she printed it. Buster Shaver and Olive seen shopping on Fifth Avenue. He on foot, she on a St. Bernard. <laughs> Somebody must have said, to Dorothy, what the hell is this bullshit? <laughs> he needed to write fiction, y'all. Not, <laughs> not fake press releases. In a film, you have to skip through time with 94 years. So, so that, that, that chapter is, you know, is, is in the book. But uh, the, it was press agent before writer, but very, very <laughs> briefly. That's hilarious. I forgot that story. Uh, sir? Uh, how would I like to be remembered? I, I, I'd like to be remembered for helping people understand how much they matter. Uh, each of us. You know, it, this, uh, you know, you guys who understand uh, this, where, you know, human beings on a planet of which they say there could be a billion in a universe. And in which they also say there could be a billion universes. So, who mattered a great deal in our lives? You know, FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You can't get your, f in the great scheme of things, you can't get, if you made somebody smile this morning, if you lifted somebody's heart a little, if you did somebody something, some good, you can't get your close, your fingers close enough to measure the difference with what you did this morning in FDR's entire life. That's a fact. If I can get anything across, I would wish to get that across. Uh, uh, sir? Gene Stapleton, what would you like to say about Gene Stapleton? Gene Stapleton, uh, when, uh, God, when, when I was asked uh, early on by people who fell in love with the show and asked, what's Gene Stapleton like? I remember the first thing I said was, she's always where she is. And it startled me to hear <laughs> that, that. And I thought, my God, isn't that an amazing thing? She always where she is. And, uh, and that's what's her. I mean, the, the, the other thing I can tell you about the way we talked about her, we asked ourselves in any situation, what would Jesus do? And that's how she reacted to anything and everything. That transsexual in one show that she c that came to her house uh, before Archie learned that he'd given mouth to mouth in a taxi cab to a guy that was <laughs> 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 it was so uh, but she f she loved that person immediately because she loved that person's humanity. That's how we answered the question about Edith. And and Gene Stapleton was you know, I'll never know a finer human being. You're watching the show and you're thinking, my God, how does she stand it? <laughs> <laughs> how does she stand, Archie? Yeah. She's acting. <laughs> <laughs> Ma'am?
I think I think Archie was a much finer person. <laughs> I really mean that. Uh, Archie was uh, afraid of progress. It scared him. That's from the very first song that Charles Strauss wrote for this piece. Uh, you know, G.R.O. La Salle gate, ran great. Those were the days. Everything was a reference to something in the past when life was simpler. Blacks moving next door scared the shit out of him. He didn't hate. He was scared to death. Uh, I think of, since you mentioned him, I think of Donald Trump as a middle finger of the American right hand. <laughs> and you can quote him on that. And he's, <laughs> and he's saying that to the establishment everywhere because this is the kind of leadership our culture is giving the American people. The American people who crave some true leadership are getting this from corporate America, from, anyway, I could go on. <laughs> Ma'am, we have, we have time for two more questions, including you. <laughs> you know, I, I determined when I was nine years old to be debonair. <laughs> Uh, I was, uh, when I was writing 16 hours a day, I had a tendency to pick my head. And my wife at the time, seeing another scab, <laughs> threw a hat on me one day and said, wear that. I, I fell in love with, the, with a hat. Also, it gets chilly up here. <laughs> and so I fell in love with a hat and I've worn it ever, it's, ever since. One more question? It's got to be a good one. Who's got the best question? This young lady right here. Why don't you talk it over for a couple of days? <laughs> Get back to us. Here's the, here's the secret. There was this day that, that all in the family was scheduled to go on three hours earlier <coughs> from a California standpoint in New York. <coughs> It was, the, the show was on the air in New York when I got a call, something we had ar been arguing about was gonna be left in the way I wanted or I wasn't gonna be there the next day. Now that sounds like a lot of courage, but the secret behind <laughs> that courage was I had been offered a three picture deal at United <laughs> Artists. <laughs> they had seen a film I'd made that wasn't out yet called Cold Turkey and they wanted me to write, produce and direct Three, three years, and, or three pictures, rather. And uh, I was in good shape, you know. <laughs> I, was, I was a good provider. So uh, it didn't take all that much courage. The reason I did the television rather than the film was there was something about Archie and my dad. My dad used to call me the laziest white kid he ever met. <laughs> I used to say, you're putting down a whole race of people just to call me lazy. He said, that's not what I'm doing and you're the dumbest white kid ever. <laughs> so I had to do that show. So sister I want to say again before, uh, these two am I am so indebted to these two wonderful, talented human beings okay. for the film you guys saw. And thank you. Oh, you, okay, what's next? Tell them what's next and then we got to skedaddle. What next? Uh, well, right now, what's next is uh, we're going to have dinner. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, uh, we made six episodes before I left L.A. day before yesterday of a new show. It's Remember One Day at a Time? Well, we're doing a Latino version, a Cuban-American family, three generations of Cuban women, starting with uh, uh, Rita Moreno in the... Uh, she's 84 years old. She's fabulous. So it, it, it's, we, it's Netflix, so you make 13 before anybody sees them. Uh, it'll premiere in January. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Tell your friends to come see the movie. It's playing here for a long time, I hope.